Welcome to the Camp Owners Podcast, a space for camp owners to talk about the unique aspects of camp ownership and get inspired by each other. We're going to sit down with camp industry experts, leaders, and fellow camp owners to hear how the camp dream transpired, learn from each other, and discuss some of the biggest issues in the private camp industry. I'm Kelly Shuna, camp owner and director of Hidden Pines Ranch. And I'm Howie Grossinger, and uh, I am the co-owner of Camp Robin Hood, a day camp in the suburbs of Toronto. If you're looking to find and subscribe to the Camp Owners Podcast, you can find us online by searching for us in your favorite podcast app. With us being a brand new podcast, we would be extremely grateful if you would rate, review, and subscribe to those apps. It will help us get the show out to other camp professionals and tell us a bit about why you love the show. Finally, if you're listening to this and think it would be useful for other camp owners or aspiring camp owners in your circle, please feel free to send them a note to listen. So Kelly, I'm really excited about our topic today. Um, Today we're going to explore how to balance our personal and professional life as camp owners. For many of us, the close relationships we foster with clients and staff can be very different than other businesses. Not to mention within our own families where many family members may or may not be involved in the business. We look forward to exploring a variety of issues that can and do arise with this topic. Uh, We are really excited Uh, to have two uh, wonderful guests with us. We have Gabe Chernov, uh, the owner director of Birch Trail Camp, and Audrey Monkey, the chief visionary officer of Gold Arrow Camp. Um, Welcome to the show, guys. And and perhaps, Gabe, you can do a little further introduction of of your, your bio and your background in camp. Well, first, Howie and Kelly, thanks so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here with you guys. Um, like you mentioned, I'm the owner and director of Birch Trail Camp for Girls in Northern Wisconsin, and I'm a second generation owner and director. My parents ran Birch Trail before me, and uh, we're a traditional residential girls camp in Northern Wisconsin. We have campers from 42 different cities and seven different countries, and we do pretty much everything you can expect a camp to do, lots of trips, lots of activities, and it's a really fun place to spend your summer. Great, and Audrey, welcome to you. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be with you all. Um, I have been at Gold Arrow Camp since 1986 and bought the camp in 1989. So over three decades at camp. And um, what else? I, I also kind of started a side gig about 10 years ago and I have a parenting blog and podcast and do um, a lot of just sort of parent and camp counselor education stuff, mostly related to forming good relationships with kids, friendship skills, and just kind of general happiness topics. So Howie, I think I already have another topic for us just after looking at Audrey's title, because when I was doing some research and listening to her podcast, I noticed that she moved to chief visionary officer. So I would love to explore that sometime about transitioning from owner director to stepping out to do something visionary or different, but still remaining in camp. So Audrey might have to book you again because that (laughs) has piqued my curiosity and I'm really inspired by that. So, all right, now that I've already derailed us, which I think I'm gonna be good at, Howie, (laughs) I am gonna move on to our first question. I gotta make sure I'm on par here. So Gabe, our first thing that we always like to talk with guests about is hearing how that camp dream started for you. So when did it start? And then when did that dream turn into a reality? When did it become something that you decided to pursue as your profession? So that's a great question. I grew up in camping. So my parents ran the camp before me and I grew up at camp with my brother and sister, just like my three kids are growing up at camp now. And, you know, as, as the kid of a camp director and a camp owner, you kind of have two parallel tracks. Um, is camp something that's going to be in my future? Or am I going to go and do something else, whether that's be an astronaut or a psychologist or a, a firefighter? And so for me, there were always these two parallel tracks. And I did some traveling after college. I was lucky enough that my parents said, you know, hey, go explore the world and and see what's out there. And I would always come back to camp during the summer, regardless of whatever country I was in during the winter, I'd always come back to camp during the summer. And it held a certain allure to me. I really debated between being a camp director and being a psychologist. And strangely enough, for those of us who are camp directors, I think there's a little (laughs) bit of both. Uh, There's kind of some similarities there in what we do. And when I was in my early 20s, I came back to camp and one summer just kind of stayed, um, didn't go back to traveling. 
And, and I just loved it. I found that I loved the work. I loved being close with my parents and learning from them. And I never left. And I think the reality is, had I become a psychologist, I'd be doing a lot of the same stuff that I do now, talking about brain science and talking about growth and helping people become better versions of themselves. Um, the reality is that now I get to shape my community into how I want people to do those things. So I would say I lucked into becoming a camp director in terms of the family that I grew up in. But I'd also like to think that I probably would have found my way into camping regardless. Well, now, Gabe, I already now have another topic for you because <laughs> we had mentioned um, succession planning. Your name had come up when we were talking about that for a future show. But what I thought about when you were talking was, as a theme for one of our shows, talking with individuals like yourself who are now the camp owner director, but how we can talk with our kids. I think about that all the time. Like, I don't want to pressure them to feel like they have to do this, but kind of talking with our kids and role modeling things and just what that felt like to be a kid who's now the owner. I just, I would love to hear your wisdom on that and advice and perspective um, just for me and, and thinking about my kids and whether or not they do that. So mark that down too. I have that on my list, Howie. I will mark it down. I think it's a fabulous topic and I have a group of people that I speak with quite often and it's one of the things that we're very cognizant of and we mm -hmm. share quite frequently is in what ways are we pressuring our children and in what ways are we not pressuring our children um, consciously or subconsciously to sort of groom them for this role. Um, and a funny story that I have if we have a moment is that I have a friend who has three children, one of whom is about nine and this child has never been spoken to about running the family business, but this child would be fifth generation. And this past summer, he went around to all the sort of heads of the areas of camp, the kitchen, the maintenance department, the horse stables, and he would say to them, well, I need to know how to do your job because if I'm going to run camp one day, I need to know how these areas operate. And it just goes to show the, the sort of the unconscious pressure that some of these kids might be under. Even though the parents have never mentioned to this child, hey, are you interested in doing this? This is what this nine-year-old thought, um, which is at the same time hysterical and scary. Yeah. Howie? Well, it's, it's really interesting, Gabe, because I'm in a similar um, situation. I have three kids all in their 20s and, you know, at a really interesting phase about, you know, carving out their own path and camp is in. We're a second generation camp as well. My wife's family has owned camp for 60 years. So it's been a, it's been a long, long, uh, wonderful uh, journey. I remember my youngest son being nine years old when I was uh, interviewing a, a young staff member and they were watching the camp video and my, my little boy comes down and he's the youngest, he's nine, he sits beside this guy and starts chatting him up and he watches the video of this young man and he turns to my son and says, wow, I really didn't realize that this is your family's camp. Like, are you gonna wanna do this someday? And he looked at him and he said, mm, I don't think so. My older sister has dibs on it. <laughs> And no one's like, and I don't know how that ever came to right. be, but it was just, it's just when you're in this business and your kids grow up and, you know, either consciously and mostly non-intentionally and subconsciously, it's, it's, it's a great topic. And uh, I'm glad um, we're going to add it to our list because I'm sure we all have some wonderful, wonderful stories about the, the challenges and, and, and just how wonderful this whole process could be. Absolutely. Our, I can already tell it'll be a great one. I have, we all, all have things. We all are doing the nodding, the active listening. Yes, I want to talk about that. So great. Well, let's get that on the docket, Howie. So Audrey, I would love to hear from you about when your camp dream started and when you realized that could be a reality or when you decided to make it a reality. So I didn't know that I had a camp dream until I landed at camp as a camp counselor in 1986. And all the stars were aligned because the camp actually was kind of on the verge of being for sale during my very first summer working there. The founder of our camp, Manny Beasy, um, he started the camp in 1933 and he had passed away in his mid eighties in December of 1985. So when I arrived at camp in June of 1986, it was the first summer without him there. And I always think that was kind of now looking back, it's sort of an interesting timing situation. Um, I was only 19 and I was a college sophomore and really fell in love with camp that summer. I fell in love with just the community and the opportunity to just really spend time getting to know kids. And I sort of changed my dream from, I always thought I'd be a teacher 
And I decided that what I liked teaching was more of the kind of life skills kind of things. I liked chatting with kids around the campfire about things that were going on at home and just loved it. I was in a, I had grown up and gone to a pretty competitive high school and I was at a competitive college and I got to camp and I was just like, oh my gosh, can I hang out here for the rest of my life? I don't really like this a lot better. And so, um, so then it just sort of, I, it, I didn't actually think it was going to happen. It was just sort of one of those pipe dreams, obviously at that point, but, um, the years went on and so many different things happened. I don't need to go into all the details, but basically it was just really meant to be because the camp was supposedly sold several times over my years working there. There were just, you know, different people coming through. We, uh, we always were talking as counselors, like, oh, are those people going to buy the camp? And are they going to make it like an East Coast camp with tennis courts? <laughs> Which you guys, um, because we're a super rustic, like tents, no electricity. Like there's barely any flat surface in our camp. It's on a lake, but it's like rocky and really, really rustic and dirty. So it's not like when I look at pictures of some of the camps that are like have a golf course and are like so clean and the bunks are just these beautiful furnishings. I mean, we are like on army cots. I mean, we're not, it's not fancy, but of course we all like it because it was our thing. So, um, so anyway, the years went on and then in 1989, I had finished college and I was actually teaching. I was doing, um, I didn't have my credential yet, but I had my emergency credential and I was teaching. I got a long-term substitute job in Northern California in middle school. And I had thought that that summer was my last summer at camp. I thought, okay, you know, that was so much fun working at camp during the summer and it was great, but that kind of part of my life is over. And I had expressed to Jeannie, the, the widow of the founder, that I would love to buy camp. And I had a partner who was older than I was. He was like in his forties and he had worked with the, them and had actually been the camp director for about 10 years. And so it just happened to be that this sale that she thought was going through did not. And she found out in December of 1988. And so she called us and said, are you still interested? She was finally really, really ready to be done. And so it was all really fast. I actually hesitated because the, my personality is such that I had moved on and thought, oh, that's not really going to be my thing. So I had like switched dreams and thought I was going to do teaching. And, um, but I quickly switched back and then um, started, I moved to Southern California in January and started working with Jeannie, the, the widow, um, while the whole process was going through. And in March of 1989, I found myself as the owner of a camp and basically had like no experience <laughs> to what I was doing. But my dad had made me write a business plan and I had gone to a bank to get a loan and it was kind of crazy and risky, but um, that's what I did. Wow. How old were you? When the sale closed, I was 20. Two. You were a visionary even back then, Audrey. That's awesome. Yep. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> so cool. I it's really hard to not just want to go off on tangents and act ask more questions, but I'm gonna be really good about staying focused. But I could talk to you guys forever. This is awesome. All right. I'm very so, proud of I'm very proud of you, Kelly. That's very good. Thank you. It's hard, but I'm going to dampen it. I'm going to keep it back here, Howie, for future shows. All right. So moving on, um, Gabe, tell me, what is your favorite part about being a camp owner? Huh. That's a really tough question um, because for me, there are so many favorite parts about being a camp owner. Um, I would say the best thing is that, like, as an example, here's a story. I have a friend who's a great guy. Uh, wonderful family, wonderful person, and he sells zippers for a living. And um, we all need zippers, right? You, you got to zip up your fly, you got to zip up your jacket. They're, they're great. Like you need a zipper. Um, but what I tell people is that my job changes lives and it changes lives in a positive way. And so I, I firmly believe in what I'm doing with my life. And I firmly believe in the benefits of it. So I could be my buddy who sells zippers and he's great. Um, but I wouldn't have the same 
belief in what I do and that what I do changes the world in a positive way. And so I love my job. It has so many wonderful benefits. My kids get to see me do my job. And my job is, is contributing to changing the world and changing people's lives for the better. And we all work hard and there's a ton of people that work hard in life, but I get to do that and produce positive results for the world. And that's probably one of the things that I like the most about my job. I like that. All right, Audrey, what's your favorite part about being a camp owner? I echo what Gabe said. I mean, it's just, I, and people who don't know what we do have no idea, but it's just, just awesome. I would say just another thing that I really love about it is just kind of that it's become this family. It's like this whole other family that we have at camp and being there for so long the privilege of getting to not only have kids kind of watch them grow up as campers and then come back as counselors, but now I have former campers and counselors whose kids, they're sending their kids and they're coming back as parents. And um, so like there are some, there are some parents who were campers when I was a counselor. I mean, you know, one of the girls that was in my cabin in 1987, her kids came for the first time last year. And I mean, what a cool thing to get to see that kind of, you know, family tradition of camp and, um, and get to know the kids of the kids that I, you know, used to work with. So I'd say that. And then with Gabe too, I mean, it's just been a fabulous place to, to be with my own kids and my husband and get to do this. It's, um, it's funny, you know, it's hard, but it's, you know, we just that community. I don't know. I don't know. There's hard, hardly any other places that have that same community family feel that summer camp does. And I feel bad for people who haven't had a chance to experience it. Well, I think, you know, Kelly, th this part of the show that we do, um, I just love so much because uh, we're about to jump into the actual topic, but the, the reality is, is that, you know, getting these, uh, this insight and, and sort of the background of our guests in this way, just, I really sets a great tone for all of us to sort of continually nod our heads and just relate because sometimes, you know, we can be in isolation a little bit and, and it's nice that, you know, we, we, we were able to explore this sort of origin story, things that really get you, you know, no matter how long you've done the job for, you know, I just, there's a real great spirit amongst the people we get to go call colleagues. So um, we're off to an awesome start. It's now time to do a little bit of business though. And I get the pleasure of thanking our podcast sponsor, Camp Brain. I'd love to give them a big shout out. Camp Brain Camp Management Software serves 1300 plus camps. They've been doing this since 1994 with 45 plus dedicated staff to meet your every need. With core modules uh, in camper, conference center, and fundraising, Camp Brain has all the features to meet your camp's needs. They are always innovating the software and releasing new features based on their deep knowledge of the camping industry. Uh, for instance, look for their new camp store module coming this spring. It will be integrated with Square to provide an excellent point of sales experience, inventory management, as well as an online store. Uh, I'm a proud Camp Brain user since uh, 1994. Um, and have uh, seen this wonderful journey that their team has taken to uh, become one of the preeminent uh, providers of this type of technology for our camps in the industry. We are now in uh, camp conference season. So uh, if you're at one of the many conferences uh, in North America, Canada, or the United States, and you're in, their exhibit, in the exhibit hall, uh, I encourage you to stop by and say hi to the folks at Camp Brain um, and get to know them and uh, learn more about what they offer. Uh, to check them out, go to campbrain.com or call 866-485-8885. Kelly? All right. So our topic today is work-life balance. So that term is used a lot and we want to unpack what that specifically looks like for camp owners. So Gabe, we'll start with you. What does work-life balance look like for you? So I have three kids that are all separated by a year. Um, so for a period of time, I had three kids under three. Um, and my, my daughter just turned nine. So right now my kids are six, seven, and nine. Um, so work-life balance when you own your own business and have three kids in elementary school is challenging. Um, so work-life balance for me used to mean not a lot because I didn't have any. Um, but recently, I would say in the past year, I've tried to make it a big goal for myself to have a work-life balance. Um, 
my work is incredibly important to me. I love what I do, and I, I realize the, the weight of, of my work. Uh, but my family is the most important thing in my life. And I consider ourselves lucky at Birch Trail that recently I hired another full-time staff member um, to do some more of the work at camp so that I could be more present with my family. And that's been allowed me to have more of a work-life balance, and it's been amazing. Um, the job that we created for this staff member was to do all the projects that our assistant director and I just never got to. You know, and I'm, I'm sure you guys know that there's things that you do in the off season when you're like, oh, we need to do this or we need to do that. Well, we've got this great idea and then it just doesn't get done. And so we came up with a list and it's two pages long of all the projects that we're gonna have this woman do. And it's amazing because if all these things get done, our camp is gonna be 700 times better than it was last year. And so we are so excited about this list of projects. But what it's allowed me to do is to take a couple hours every day and not be in the office and still get everything finished. So I've taken that time and made sure that every day I'm home and I'm making breakfast for my kids and I'm there when they wake up and when they get on the bus. And it allows me time to be home around five-ish every day. And we have dinner time together and our dinners are tech-free dinners. There's no screens on. We have conversations and we have dinner time traditions. It's allowed me time to go to the gym, I'd say almost every day, um, but way more than I would before. And it's allowed me time to really have a balance between maintaining a consistent work schedule and the same quality of work, but getting more enjoyable out of my life and that comes from my kids maybe a hobby or two but mainly kids and work and it's been fantastic because up until last year I wasn't so good at having the work-life balance. <laughs> well you make me feel very hopeful Gabe because I am taking the giant leap off the cliff and just hired my first full-time your own person and he starts in two weeks but that was very scary very scary, wondering would he be twiddling his thumbs all fall and what was he gonna do? And is that pressure for me to then be working on camp in my off season when I need a little time? But hearing you say that uh, makes me very hopeful that that will be, help me with balance too, so. You know, I think it's one of camp directors, I'm generalizing here, but I think it's one of our greatest strengths and our greatest weaknesses is that we're all such control freaks. And I'm saying that in a good way, um, but that nobody cares about the health and safety of our campers and staff as much as we do. And so we spend so much time and energy and effort making sure that our camps are the best places they can be. And it's hard to entrust that to somebody else. And so hiring a staff member and trusting that they're gonna do as good of a job or care as much as we do, is a really big step. Um, but when you find those people, the right people, and they do as good of a job or better than we do, it's amazing because it allows us that time for that work-life balance. So congratulations, an early congratulations to you. I'm sure you're gonna love it. Thank you, I hope so. When I want more time to do what's in Audrey's title is the yeah. visionary. I have all these <laughs> visions and ideas, but you can't get to them when you are doing the day-to-day. -day. So I'm going to be on my track for a visionary like Audrey now is my goal with this person. So Audrey, transitioning to you, um, what does work-life balance look like for you? Well, I, I think I almost laughed out loud when I got invited to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think I read something a few years ago that really there's no such thing. Like life is just life and, you know, you kind of weave in and out of different things that you're working on. And I think in camp, I found it to, there was a lot of overlap. So, you know, even in our, you know, like our personal life and family time, you know, sometime we'll have an extra, like we just had a, a visiting person who I call my fourth daughter. She grew up at camp with one of my other kids. Um, I will say that now that my kids are all grown and out of the house, it's a lot easier to have the time for, <laughs> for all the, you know, exercise and reading and all this stuff. So the last few years have been better for me. Um, I think getting older too also was helpful because I needed more sleep. So I couldn't do, you know, the late nights even during the summer. So I've put better boundaries lately of just, you know what, I'm not going to do the meetings that start at 9 p.m. at camp. I just let someone else can do those. So, so yeah, letting go of some of the control and realizing that I have all these great people who can do these things and trying to focus. And I think that's part of the reason with changing the title. So I encourage you to think about somebody at your camp. It's likely you guys are the ones who are thinking big picture, long term. And uh, that's what I know that I've always done at camp and it's better for camp for me to spend time on that than to get really 
caught up in the day-to-day -day administrative stuff because then we might lose sight of, of things. Like yesterday, what I worked on is we have summer themes. I was working on the curriculum for our counselors and their training on carrying out like what they're going to do with the campers on the summer theme. And I wouldn't have had time for something like that, you know, 20 years ago because I was just like talking to parents and registering kids and doing the day-to-day. -day. So anyway, um, but in terms of balance, I think that I came to terms with the fact that during the summer when I'm really, really busy and kind of no matter what schedule I set, I could never stick to it. I don't know if you find that, but it's like, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to check in with staff from this time to this time and I'm going to walk around to activities and never ever in 35 years have I ever been able to follow any schedule I've ever put together for myself. And I always think, well, why can't I just do this? It seems so easy. But then the day, you know, you just are kind of people come to talk to you and someone's sad and, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, just there's always things. So you can't follow a schedule. So I came to terms quite a long time ago that during the summer, I would not have as much time with my kids, but they were having a lot of fun. So it worked out, especially when they became camp age, they were great. They loved being with all the counselors and their friends. And so it got that was pretty nice. Um, and then during the rest of the year, I think we've always done, you know, pretty, we've all, co you know, we've coached our kids and, you know, dinner, family dinners we had every night. And so, so I think it was better than most jobs. I mean, I feel like a lot of parents in many jobs all year round are in this grind that, you know, too long of days and everything. So I think there's, there's a gift in that, that at least once we put the last, get the last kid home at the end of the summer, we're just responsible for our own family. And I, I always like that feeling just back to them and, and focusing on them. So, um, so I don't, I don't know that I'm an expert at it, but I've come to terms with that. My life is my life and I create most of the work myself by my new ideas and projects. So it's my own, <laughs> I've kind of made my bed and I'm, I'm lying in it now. So I have all these things that I do, but I really do love them all. So I don't, I, I, I don't have a lot of leisure time, but that's okay. Good. Um, I was curious to know if your spouses, partners are involved in the day-to-day -day camp with you or if they have separate careers or they are not involved at all. Gabe, you want to go first and tell us? So thank you. My wife is not involved at camp during the winter time. And during the summer, she's primarily focused on our children, but we'll do a lot of the mother functions at camp. So I would say in the winter time, no, not really involved at camp at all. And during the summer, she is certainly at camp and very, very present at camp. Her primary focus is our children, but I would say a good portion of her day is probably taken up with campers that come to her with specific needs. Um, I'm sad. I miss my mom. Um, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? We run a girls camp. I'm a guy. Um, most of our girls, when they get their period for the first time, don't want to talk to me about it. <laughs> Some of them do. What? I have no idea why. I don't want to talk about it. Uh, my wife fills that role very well. Um, so there are a lot of things like that that she's <clears throat> fantastic at that I am not. What about you, Audrey? That was so funny. I just have to do a side story for Gabe. So we do once a summer, we take like the leadership staff, like we'll do like a girl's night. Like I did a hosted a sleepover. And always when we're leaving, we're like, okay, guys, are you ready for dealing with any of the, you know, the, <laughs> the female issues? And they're all like, oh, you know, don't anybody get sad or anything while we're gone. Anyway, um, so my husband actually, he he runs camp. He's like the operations business person at camp. Um, he didn't know that that was his dream. He was going to be a doctor, but um, he switched gears. And that was um, not when we were first married. He was, when we were first married, he was helping with like getting our computers set up and doing a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. But after we had our first daughter, he switched gears and decided to come over and be a camp person. And I'm very grateful because honestly, I could not do what I get to do without him keeping things together. So he's, he's the operations business, kind of runs, keeps things going, new buildings that we're doing, talking to all those people, insurance stuff. I mean, he does all that. What about you, Howie? Yeah, so, you know, my wife and I have been working together, you know, for close to 25 years now doing this. And uh, it's, uh, it's been amazing. We, I think at the end of the day, you know, these uh, spousal relationships in the business is all about playing to your strengths. Um, so much overlap in what we do. And 
I'm always curious about the topic of work-life balance and could you ever not take your work home, you know, kind of thing. And, and it's, it's really hard and it's just trying to pick your spots, but you know, just, just, you know, like Gabe and Audrey had mentioned, you know, it's really of just about, you know, capturing those moments because you cherish and you cared so deeply about what you do that you want to just be able to be the, you know, show off the best parts of yourself. Uh, I can speak for myself that our, our close team gets a, you know, a front row seat to our relationship and everything that happens. And it's part of the business, you know, where it's all relational as we all know. And, um, I think that I can, I can very honestly say that, you know, sometimes my staff have seen me at my best with my wife and sometimes not so good and maybe she'd say vice versa, but I can honestly say that, you know, it, it, it has its challenges, but I, I don't know, you wouldn't, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. But, but the point is, is that navigating that is really, um, you know, an incredible adventure with so many rewards. And then you add, if you're in, in the situation where you have your children getting to see, you know, their parents seen as parent figures to other children too, is such an interesting thing for your kids to grow up in too. And, and as Audrey said, you know, there are moments in each summer where, you know, your kids want a little piece of you, but sometimes mom and dad have other kids to take care of. And I think as they get older, and I know for my own case, you know, they've come to appreciate the fact that their best friends see my wife and I in a light that a lot of other friends' parents aren't seeing. So I think that's sort of part of this wonderful thing we get to do. So, um, you know, it, it, it's very interwoven and uh, you just, you, you find a way to make it work. Yeah, I would love to explore that another show topic is working with your spouse because I'm the only one out of the three of us then whose spouse is not involved with the day to day of camp. So my husband and I own it together and are invested 100%, but he has a separate career from camp. So we live here and he's my, you know, unpaid maintenance, uh, silent, you know, counselor, mental health coordinator, lawyer, all that stuff. But we don't do the day to day together. But we work obviously on this and someday I think that the two of us will do it together and how will we navigate that and I think we'll have to be really conscious about who's responsible for what and working together but having very separate roles and knowing what that other person is a lead on. So I'd love to explore that. So it's interesting for me to hear uh, how you guys are navigating that in the roles. So that's great. Our next question um, on this topic is about boundaries. And I think each of you have talked a little bit about boundaries and sort of, you know, we, we, we sort of touched on it. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit about work-life balance in the context of boundaries with clients. You know, uh, parents see us as a incredible source for everything. You know, once, once they come to our camps and we build those relationships, and I think it's very unique both in the day and the sleepover camp setting, you know, depending on the geography of your clientele and how connected you are to the communities from which they come from, you know, there is the challenge. And I'm wondering, Audrey, from your experience, how you've navigated, maybe not navigated, don't know <laughs> sort of how to, you know, put on the brake sometimes when a setting or a situation is not appropriate for you guys to chat with or about. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I could think of a lot of scenarios have, you know, as I, I'm sure you can, but I think we want to explore just this issue of boundaries with clients and sort of what your, your sense about and your experience with that is. Yeah, that's a great topic and something that I think camp people really need to be aware of. I know a lot of camp directors have a lot of, you know, their friends, kids go to their camps and that kind of thing. And so it does, there's like a lot of overlap and it can get awkward, especially if there's something that, you know, kid doesn't have a great experience and they're your friend or something like that. I think one thing that was helpful for me, I really was, especially when my kids were young, I was very kind of like boundary focused during the year, like where I didn't, you know, like if, if my kids were at school and somebody wanted to, you know, you know, pick my brain about what's kind of sleeping bag to camp, I would say, oh, you know what, give me a call or at the office. This was before email, by the way. Um, 
So I would, I would try to divert people that way um, and not get into like an in-depth discussion with them. So I would try to do that kindly, just say, let's, you know, let's talk about this later, you know, if we're at school right now. Um, but one thing that really helped me, and this is, will sound crazy to you, is we moved. We moved away from where most of our campers are from. So um, we live kind of in the middle of sort of nowhere in California now in the foothills, about an hour from our camp. And so our campers and our camp community is actually not right here. So it was kind of helpful for us because it made like a more like our friends and, and people we socialize and things that we do are mostly um, some of them are camp staff and like old counselors and that kind of thing. But a lot of it is just people that that we've met through here. So I like having some different circles of community that are not just camp and you know camp families and um so yeah so i think part of it was that is just ge geography makes plays a role and i would say to camp people it's a good idea not to have all your um clientele be your you know <laughs> at your kid's school uh that i just i think that it's 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 difficult i think to have that too much of an overlap but I know it's a it's the reality for a lot of people. But um, but that's not ours. Our kids once we moved here, um, our kids didn't go to school with any other kids, so they had their own friends too outside of camp and separate yeah. from camp. Mm. So I think that's that was part that helped with the boundary situation. Nice. And Gabe, your thoughts on 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 this issue of boundaries with clients? What's your experience? So one of the things I love about camp directors is I feel like some of us are, are of such similar mindsets. I feel like a lot of Audrey's answers, I could just say ditto, and it would make the podcast a lot shorter. Um, so I want to uh, preface by saying all of, all of my answers, this is a very conscious choice on my end, um, but I feel like I'm very, very accessible to my camp families. And I think part of it is that we don't live in an area where the majority of our camp families are from. So, so much like Audrey, you know, 95% of our camp community does not live where my kids go to school. Um, there are a small amount of families um, that are from our school system, and I'm talking two or three. And those families are very, very friendly and nice and kind and do not monopolize my time. If we see them at dance or at school or at sporting events, they fully get it that I'm there as a parent and not as a camp director. And I am so thankful for that. But I, I am very, very accessible to my families. And for us, camping is a very personal relationship. Um, we are truly their partners in parenting. And we have their children for four or eight weeks at a time. So when we meet with a new family, we literally meet with every family in person. So I travel for a large percentage of the year and we have families in 42 different cities and we go to every one of those cities and we meet every family individually and we sit down in the living room and we talk with them and because of that and this is going to sound like a terrible word but I feel like we offer a, almost a concierge level of service if we have their children in our care for four weeks and a family wants to call me and talk about something and it's five o'clock on a Tuesday night I'm going to answer the phone. Now, if I'm in the middle of dinner with my kids, I'm not going to answer the phone. Um, but if my kids are just hanging out and something else is going on and it's not important, I will fully answer the phone and talk to my camp parents. So I kind of have an on time and an off time. And I would say my on time is quite large, but I fully respect that off time. If I'm at an activity with my kids, if we're having family dinner, if we're on vacation, my phone is off and, and it goes to voicemail. But all my camp parents have my cell phone number and they know that they can call me or text me. And if I'm available, I'm available and if I'm not they are fully respectful and they get it and it's okay and things like family vacations and family time is sacred and I I'm thankful that my camp parents get that and they respect it amazing thank you for expanding on ditto that was great but I I have to add ditto as well um, so Kelly you and I come from you know the day camp world you know and I'm curious in your case you know um, rel relatively new camp owner uh, relationships within the community. Maybe we can just chat a little bit about, you know, the day camp experience around boundaries because typically we're, we're much closer to our clientele from where we live and, and how we are active on a daily basis. Maybe you can comment a little bit about your own experience on that. So I'm in the thick of being in my community and my children because my children are 13 11 and 9 so elementary and middle school and we live in a relatively small town so we're in stillwater minnesota which is right outside the twin cities area and stillwater really prides itself in being a small town community feel but close to a metro area so i see kids all the time whether it's 
at Target or, you know, kind of like the summer principal where some of them are like, Kelly, and they get run over and give me a hug. And I'm like, what's your name? What's your name? Okay, I remember you. And then other kids kind of give me the side glance and wait for me to acknowledge. But I see campers all the time. And I, at this point, I love seeing them. But I really appreciate also Audrey's advice of when people talk to you of, yeah, you know what, you should call or email me. Um, but most of the time, it's just people are happy to see you and want to say how excited they are to come back. And um, But you do also have in the experience of seeing campers that aren't coming back and navigating that because we're just going through registration right now and you see who is and who isn't. And I always try to make them feel comfortable that even if they're not coming back, I still am so happy to see them and want the best for them and uh, definitely still say hi and acknowledge them. So, but yeah, I see campers all the time in families and families and conscious of that when I'm out and about and what I'm doing and saying and you know, I have to at least put on a hat if I haven't taken a shower because I got to be somewhat presentable. <laughs> yes, and, and I can totally identify with that as well. You know, um, our family's been involved in our day camp for 60 years, just like Audrey's story. I am now seeing the children of my former campers who then were on staff with me. And now my daughter is their supervis supervisors, their kids age division. And, you know, and whether it's day camp or overnight camp, you know, those cycles are just so wonderful. But at the same time, we're immersed in our community. And, you know, accessibility is, I think, you know, Gabe, you, you coined it right. Like we all have to make a determination of how accessible we are that fits into your own lifestyle and geography is a factor, but also, you know, technology because, you know, families now, you, you know, you can connect with families in all kinds of ways, you know, 42 cities, but if a family wants to FaceTime you and sets up an appointment, you know, I, I totally appreciate that the time you'll make and then make a good decision on how that impacts the time with your children and your wife and your family time. But, you know, you establish a relationship with your family such that the commitment is there, therefore we have to find the right time to make it all work so they can continue to have the confidence in us. We're a day camp. My family's have my wife's cell number, you know. We're, you know, she's, you know, she doesn't want a parent of a four-year-old who had a, you know, told mommy that she didn't have a good time. If she calls at 1030 at night, my wife may not want that parent to go to bed upset uh, and wonder if, Little Jamie may get on the bus tomorrow morning. So, you know, we all navigate that. And sometimes we have people who do that for us. But again, depending on your operation and sort of how you put yourself out there, it may end up resting on you. Um, so you may have to excuse yourself from your 12-year-old's halftime soccer game to take a quick call in the middle of the summer for day camp. And I'm sure we have lots of examples of that. It's just finding the right balance. But I think, uh, you know, I think... Parents, I think for the most part, uh, I still have confidence that parents, for the most part, will pick and choose the right topics and the right times to have these discussions with us, especially in public, if there's any concerns and stuff. But, you know, sometimes they don't, and we have to navigate those as well. So um, I really appreciate your, you, share, you guys sharing uh, your thoughts on that. Kelly? All right, our last technical question we have here is we want to hear if you have any practical tips or things you've ultimately learned that have allowed you to strike the proper work-life balance as a professional. So Audrey, you said you're still working on it or you, what is that? But any tips that you would pass on to us, and we'll start with Gabe, about any tips you have or things you've learned either the easy way or the hard way that you would suggest? I would say in terms of things that I've learned, I think to me, it's, it's been vitally important to make time for my kids and for my life and to put the things in place, whether that's people or protocols, but to put the things in place that allow you to do that. Um, so for me, it's been setting up um, the employees and the staff and, and the protocols in camp, whether that's automation software or whatever you need um, to make your life work where you can spend that time with your family. And for me, that's mornings where I'm with the kids. It's night times where I'm with the kids. And then what I've learned recently, which took me a long time to learn, and I don't know why it took so long, but as they say, hindsight is 20, 20 um, is finding things that you get happiness from. And that's been so important. Um, and because we're so busy during the summer, it, it's so vitally important to take care of ourselves during the off season. And I, I would say during the summer season too, but we all know that that's just not <laughs> realistic. Um, 
but as, as I've gotten older, it's one thing that I've learned that it's okay to take time for yourself and to have things that you enjoy. Um, and as they say, you can't pour from an empty cup. And so this stuff only makes you better at your job. And so whatever that may be, whether it's yoga or going for a drive in a, in a sports car or tennis or whatever it may be that, that you enjoy, mm. finding out what that is and then making time for it. Um, and when I was younger, I would just spend all of my time working um, because I thought that was the most important thing is having the most successful business and devoting all that time to work. And then as I got older, I realized, you know what, sometimes I need to devote some time to me and to, and to my happiness. And I've always been a pretty happy guy, uh, but sometimes you need to find those things that you do for yourself. Um, and I think also in terms of that happiness, for me, it's been really important to remember the many benefits that camp provides for our families. And how you touched on this earlier, and to me, it, it resonates so deeply, is that our campers, I mean, our kids at camp get such a great benefit by seeing what we do. And so many kids or so many kids of their parents have no idea what their parents do. Their parents leave the house in the morning, they come home at nighttime, and the kids just have no idea what their parents do. They say, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a doctor, my mom's this, my mom's that. They don't know what that means. And what our children or children of camp directors get to see is they get to see what their parents do and they get to see what their parents do for other people and they can see it and feel it and describe it. And I think that's so amazing. And so for me, that's one of the sources that I have for happiness is knowing that my kids know what my job is, they know what it means, and they know what it feels like, and they have that description, and they see me going to work every day during the summer and know what I'm doing. And so even during those summer days where, and gosh, something Audrey said just resonated with me when she was like, I have this schedule, and I'm going to meet with the staff, and then it just doesn't happen. And I was like, oh my gosh, ditto, that's, that's my day. Uh, when I have those days, I think back, and I think to myself, yeah, my kids are seeing this, and they're seeing me be a parent to other people, and they're seeing the difference that I'm making. And that's an amazing feeling to have. And at the end of the day, when I think, gosh, I didn't get that list and I didn't get to that staff member, I can take solace in the fact that my kids know what I do and they see the benefit in that. All right, Audrey, what about you? So, um, so it's funny, as we've been talking, I was thinking back to when my kids were little and I think that actually having kids helped me balance better because I am really efficient with my work. So I found that before, before I had kids, I could just, you know, you can make work stretch out all day and you can keep thinking of new things to do and it can just go on and on and on. Once you have kids, you can't do that anymore. And that really helped me a lot. So I was very much like when my kids were little, you know, I'd be a room mom and I'd drop them off at preschool and pick them up at preschool and I'd do some calls from home and I was just kind of flexible. But when I had, you know, a block of three hours or something, I would just like knock out a whole staff training thing or really get stuff done. And I have always thought, and I know I'm that kind of person that just when I have limited time, I'm actually better and more efficient. So there's a couple, I am a huge fan of like you know, efficiency and productivity books and things. And um, Cal Newport's Deep Work has really meant a lot to me. Um, I think he's, he basically says the superpower of our and future generations is the ability to focus deeply and get things done and really create new things as opposed to just surface like answering many texts and doing all these emailing and everything. And so I have really focused on that for the last couple of years of just when I start my day not checking the email and instead spending you know, 45 minutes um, just doing something that's a deep work project, like I was telling you yesterday about the theme work. So I spend time doing things that are of the highest value first. Of course, I waste time too, but like everybody, but I just think that people have a weird perception of like their work day. And uh, Laura Vanderkam has a lot of stuff about how people think they don't have time for things, but then when they actually track their time, they see how much time they spend scrolling on social media, watching TV, um, doing things that that could be instead with your kids, reading a book, other things. So I'm very aware of my time and how I'm spending it, but um, that's been a lifelong journey of figuring it out. But so I do, I get a lot done in a, in a shorter period of time now. And that's kind of what I've mastered camp wise. And so I think that's kind of my, my thing now is I actually, I exercise every day. I read every day. I talk to my kids every day when, you know, I, I kind of, I, I only come into my office actually once or twice a week. I work mostly from home because I get more done there. And then I come in here to meet with people and have our meetings and stuff like that. So I guess I kind of am doing better than I thought in the balance department. Well, look at that, Audrey. 
Congratulations. <laughs> I just figured it out talking to you guys. <laughs> Well, good. I'm glad you're on then. So we're going to wrap up the show today, how we're going to finish all of our shows. And that's talking about inspiration. And so we want to end with something that's inspiring us right now. This can be a book, an article, a podcast, documentary, anything that's just firing you up to be the very best camp owner that you can be. So we'll start with Howie. What is inspiring you right now? I just realized uh, that I might be late to the party on this, and um, I wanted to share with you that I discovered radical candor. Have you, uh, I just recently, um, following the podcast, I know it's been out for a while, but I was listening to a webinar and people mentioned it, and a big part of my professional life in camping has been about staff de development and helping my young staff who are in supervisory positions to have really good conversations and, and, and deeply show they care, but also at the same time, um, help them develop change in staff behavior and choices. And I've just found this a really fascinating podcast. I'm on their website and my juices are flowing about how my supervisory staff training weekend in May will sort of have features of, you know, giving them, you know, different things to um, consider and approaches when it comes to sort of delivering that supportive mentoring supervision we want, but coupled with some of the stuff that I get from Radical Candor. So I encourage people to check it out and I hope it brings you as much inspiration as it has for me. All right, Gabe, what is inspiring you right now? I've just started reading a book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It's a great book. It, it's describing basically two thought systems. There's system one, which is kind of fast, instinctive, and emotional thought. And then system two, which is slow, deliberative, and logical thoughts. And I, I'm not very far into it, but I'm already really just struck by how amazing it is. And I'm very, very excited to finish it. All right. Audrey, what about you? Um, so something I find myself talking a lot about right now is uh, Simon Sinek's new book, The, In uh, the Infinite Game. And it was funny because you guys mentioned about my title. I read the book after we had changed my title, like it's been like a year. And he recommends that every business have um, two people, at least, who are running it. One who's the visionary and one who's the operations person. And he said that a lot of times when business people, they do very well in one organization and then they go somewhere else and don't do as well, it's because they're not surrounded by the people who complement their skills. So that is one part of the book that I, I think it's just a book that everybody should read because it's also about the way we look at what we do and how looking at our lives and our businesses as an infinite game is very different than what a lot of people do now. Um, kind of the current business thinking is about shareholder returns and very short-term thinking. And many businesses, businesses like the lifespan of a business is very short now compared to like 50 years ago. And so I just think the infinite game, it's a great book. I listened to it as an audio book and then I had my husband listen to it. And then I let Simon Sinek has a lot of good stuff. His start with why and I love all of his work. So that's my current inspiration. I've been hearing his name a lot. So I think I'll be putting all those in my Amazon cart for the ACA National Conference flight over to California. So I would say for me, I was so inspired by Brene's, Brene Brown books, Dare to Lead, the spring that I, basically that's how I framed my, how to have difficult conversations at my staff training. I trained them on her rumble theory, on rumble starters, being clear and kind. And this fall I was kind of thinking about if I was gonna do that again. And I've been inspired again to revisit some of her other books after doing my returning staff check-ins. They keep talking about how Brene has, you know, transformed into their life. It's come with them from camp into their relationships at college and with their significant others. And I was so inspired. I even submitted some conference proposals on how to use it. So I am inspired right now to get back into some Brene Brown and introduce some new things with my staff training from her. I just think she's fantastic. So, all right. Well, I'm inspired to order some new books. Thank yes. you. Lots of, lots of great stuff. Thank you very much. As we approach the end of this wonderful conversation, I'd just like to ask each of you and maybe Gabe, if, if people want to get a hold of you and learn more about your program, maybe you could just share with our listeners uh, uh, how they can do that. Sure. They could just send me an email, Gabe, G-A-B-E at Birchtrail, B-I-R-C-H-T-R-A-I-L.com. 
And Audrey? Uh, probably the best place to find most of my work is at my website, which is sunshine-parenting.com. And that's where you can access lots of information and my podcast and my book and things like that. Wonderful. Wonderful. And Kelly, where can our, our, our listeners get a hold of you? Well, our website for our day camp is hiddenpinesranch.com. But to get hold of me via email is kelly with a Y at hiddenpinesranch.com. And if you want to learn more about what I do north of the border, uh, camprobinhood.ca. And you can reach me at howie at camprobinhood.ca. Um, I want to thank you all for just a wonderful, wonderful conversation on a really important topic. Um, I want to let our listeners know that uh, don't forget that you can find all of our show notes at gocamp.pro backslash COP. There's lots of good stuff there from our show and other camp, uh, Go Camp Pro podcasts out there. We really hope you enjoyed our podcast. Thank you to our guests, and we can't wait till our next episode. Have a good one, everybody.